Hello, brothers and sisters. This is Kevin Cosby here in Louisville, Kentucky, St. Stephen Baptist Church with another powerful point to ponder as we spend meaningful moments with the master looking at the word of God. And of course, the master I'm referring to is the Lord Jesus Christ. Everyone needs three things in your life. You need the three M words, mission, master, mate. Those are the three most important decisions you will ever make. What will be my mission? in life? Who will be my master? Who will be my mate? Get those three things right, okay? And the master I'm talking about when I say spending meaningful moments with the master, of course, is the Lord Jesus Christ. The disciples never referred to Jesus as Jesus. Not one time did Peter or James or John or Bartholomew or any of the disciples say, hey, Jesus, they always called him Lord or they called him master. You know, Lord or master. And Jesus is our master. Uh, it, which is to say that Jesus is or should be the CEO, the chief executive officer in our life. And we are spending meaningful moments with our CEO, hearing from our CEO, our chief executive officer, our master, Jesus Christ. We're in this series entitled uh, The Same Bee That Stings is the bee that produces honey. And we're seeing how sometimes <laughs> the things that sting us the most sometimes turn out to be the sweetest things in our lives. And we're looking at Acts chapter 16, as Paul, who wanted to go to Bithynia, wanted to go to Mysia, ended up in a place called Troas, but he has a vision in Troas that Paul would come over from Occidental culture to, or, to, I mean, to Oriental culture, to Occidental culture, to Europe, Europe, and he goes over to Philippi, and there he meets a woman named Lydia of Thyatira, who was the wealthiest woman in the area. And God's gonna open up her heart to Paul because Paul was kind to her. And once God opens up her heart, she opens up her home. And her home becomes the headquarters, um, the beachhead for Paul's, Paul's mission uh, into Europe, into Philippi of Macedonia. Where you have on one end of the social spectrum, you have Lydia. She is the elite of the elites. But you also have somebody who is at the bottom whose name is not mentioned, and she also is a woman. And I want you to see the social contrast, and it's all in the 16th chapter of Acts, between Lydia and some other unnamed woman who is at the very bottom, the, the ultimate dregs of society. Paul's gonna meet her too. And notice what it says in Acts chapter 16, verse 16. One day, as we were going down to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl. Now, Lydia is a merchant. Remember, she's a merchant that sells purple. purple. She owns Neiman Markham, Markham Marcus. Now, some people call Neiman Marcus, Neiman Mark up. But anyway, she, she's a very wealthy woman. On the other end of the spectrum is this unnamed slave girl. We met this unnamed, uh, we met a slave girl who had the spirit that enabled her to tell the future. And brothers and sisters, if somebody can tell you what horse is going to win before the horse race, or what NBA team's going to win the NBA championship before the champions are over, do you know how much money you would make? If somebody can tell you what stocks are going to be hard, hard, uh, high and what stocks will not be high, you can make a whole lot of money. And this slave girl had the spirit of divination. She could tell people the future. But it was because she had a, an evil spirit in her. And they were exploiting her. It says she earned a lot of money. She's a slave girl for her masters by telling their fortunes. Look at verse 17. Verse 17 says, she followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God and they have come to tell you how to be saved. Because she knew who they were because she had the spirit to discern things. So she knew who these men were. Verse 18, this went on day after day until Paul got so exasperated that he turned and said to the demon within her, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and instantly it left her. Her master's hope of wealth were now shattered because the demon was gone that was giving her the ability 
to predict and to tell people's futures. So they grabbed Paul and Silas, dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, they shouted to the city officials. These Jews, they shouted, they are teaching customs that are illegal to us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas and the officials ordered them stripped and beaten with rods. So you have uh, in this city of Philippi, like in any city, you have uh, diversity of opportunity and diversity of privilege. You have Lydia, who is a, a wealthy woman. She's a merchant. She helps resource the apostle Paul. And then you have this unnamed slave girl and you have that in your community as well. And she is a slave girl, which means she is being exploited. Her owners, think about it, owning a person is using her for profit only. They're not concerned about her as a person. They're only concerned about how they can exploit her. They're not concerned about her welfare. They're not concerned about her mental health. They're not concerned about her restoration. They're not concerned about the demonic that has taken a hold of her life. They only are concerned about one thing, and that is profit. And Paul, and she would come around Paul and say, these men are from the most high God and they tell you how to be saved. And Paul, we're told, here's the word, was exasperated by her. In other words, she, he was frustrated. Now, he's not frustrated at her. He's frustrated at the circumstances, the society that did not care about her, was did not care about her as an individual. So what does Paul do? Paul saves her and as a result or, uh, as a result of her being saved, leads her to salvation in Christ. And as a result of her being saved, she no longer is bringing profit to those who exploited her. And brothers and sisters, sometimes you can't change the system, but you can choose not to participate in the system. The system of slavery still existed, but she no longer was a participant in it. The system of white supremacy, according to the great scholar, Harvard scholar, Derek Bell, will always be in place. But that does not mean that you have to participate. And she's no longer a participant in the system that is oppressing her. Paul has delivered her. Now, he wants to change the system, and we should be changing the system. We should be changing the system because systems cheat and systems exploit people. You know, we have a lot of people who talk about, well, we need to go to the inner city and witness to people because there's so much crime in the inner city and drugs in the inner city. Well, all these quote unquote evangelicals who want to come to the urban community to help the poor black people who are selling drugs and engaging in crime that ends them, puts them in jail. If you really want to help black people, then change the systems that produce the crime and the drug selling because the system is a system that is a system of, um, of inequity, a system in which people don't have opportunities. You can, you can stop the, the trafficking of drugs in urban communities today if we had a federal jobs bill that gave people living wages, health care, and if they were able to go to school and, you know, whether it's liberal arts or a trade school to get a job. And then we have jobs that have been created by the federal government that's paying $20 an hour. That would eliminate a whole lot of the drugs and would help stimulate poor urban communities. But we don't want to do that because we are a greedy nation. Uh, back in the 70s, after World War II, from 1945 to 1970, listen to me, about 70% oh, of the income of wealthy, wealthy elites, 70% of their income was taxed. But with the Reagan revolution and the neoliberals, and neoliberals means Democrats who are acting like Republicans, they have had tax cut after tax cut after tax cut, which means that the elites who used to have 70% of their taxes, uh, of their money taxed, now today only have about 37% of their, their vast fortune tax, which means there is not much money for education and infrastructure and jobs. And that is 
an unequal society. If you want to change the conditions of people or help fix the people in poor neighborhoods, then take away the poverty. Because when people are in poor situations, they do desperate things. Well, once, once, watch this, once we are told that Paul is able to help this girl get saved so she's no longer participating in her own subjugation, that those who lost money uh, because she's now saved come after Paul. And sometimes when you are a Christian doing the work of the Lord, people will come after you. And they appeal to the worst instincts in people, in first, in the people in Philippi. Notice what they say again, skip down to verse 19. Look at verse 19, we're gonna start here and look at this. It says in verse 19, her master's hope of wealth was now shattered, so they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the authorities at the marketplace. The whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews, because of these Jews. Let me tell you what they are appealing to. They're appealing to racism. They're saying, uh, these are some Jews, and it says, uh, and verse 21 says, they are teaching customs that are illegal for us Romans to practice. So they say, we're Romans, these are Jews. These are Jews. So they're appealing to racial nationalism, which is high today. What we're dealing with today in America is what's called white Christian nationalism. What is white Christian nationalism? White Christian nationalism is is the unity of white Americans against people who are not white Americans. And it's usually, this is what constitutes a white nationalist. First of all, they're white, or they, or they're, the origin is from, from Europe. Secondly, they are quote unquote Christian, or they have a brand of Christianity. Listen, everybody who says they're Christian does not mean that they are a Christian. There's a, they have a certain brand of Christianity. In other words, they cherry pick the Bible and find things in the Bible that helps to support and undergird um, what they perceive, what is in fact in their best interest. So they're white, they have origins in Europe, white Europeans, they identify as Christians, they're nativist. A nativist is somebody who was born, their family is born in the United States, so they are opposed to people like Paul, who is a Jew, coming from the outside, interfering with their interests. They also are fiscal conservatives, which means they don't, they would rather have taxes for the wealthy at 37% instead of 70% so we can create jobs. They're nativists. And they also believe in the American mythology, namely the American mythology that America is such a great, great nation that is non-racist. That is white Christian nationalist. And you have these nationalists in Philippi who are coming after Paul and appealing to the nationalistic impulses of the Philippians saying these are Jews. If you want to get a good example of what white Christian nativist nationalism American mythology is all about, then remember what happened on January the 6th of this year. That is white Christian nationalism. That is the mob, the same mob that came after Paul in Philippi. That is the mob. What I'm trying to tell you, brothers and sisters, is that the reason why the Bible is so powerful is because it mirrors everything that we are experiencing in society today. And they come after Paul they arrest Paul for helping a woman who has a demon. See, there's a lot of people that claim they want to see people saved as long as they can get it at discounted prices. Getting this woman saved will mean that some people will not be able to explore her anymore. And of course, it's never about people. For some people, it's always about profit. So verse 20 says this as we close. Verse 20 says the whole city is in an uproar because of these Jews. They shouted to the city officials. They are teaching customs. They are illegal for us Romans to practice. A mob quickly formed against Paul and Silas. The city and the city officials ordered them stripped and beaten with rods. Now let me ask you a question. Is this, is this a stinger or is this honey? Well, we'll find out 
tomorrow, whether it's a stinger or if this, if this is honey. But one thing we must remember is this, is that in the past, what Paul thought was a stinger was really honey. When he didn't get to go to Mysia and Bithynia and ended up in Troyes, but he found Luke, what looked like a stinger was really a honey. When he gets to Philadelphia and was expecting a big crowd with a whole lot of men, instead of seeing a whole lot of men there, there is a small group of women. It looks like a stinger, but it's really honey because one of those women was the richest women around whom God opened her heart to Paul named Lydia. And when God opened her heart, she opened her home to Paul. So based on what Paul has seen, his faith is growing now to believe that even though I'm being beaten with rods and arrested, I'm not going to call this a stinger yet. I'm going to say maybe even though it doesn't feel good and even though I'm in pain right now, this may be honey. And based on what you've seen God do in your life, through your life, where God has brought you, you be careful about calling something a stinger that really may be a honey, it may be honey until you see what God is ultimately up to. You ask yourself, I wonder where this is ultimately going to take me. You never know how God can use the worst things to take you to the best place. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. And uh, thank you that what we read today is so relevant to what's going on in our country today. Help us, oh God, to be like Paul, to speak out for justice, especially against those who are being exploited. It's all about people, Lord, and not about profit for you. So help us to be that way. Bless your people. And thank you for this opportunity to grow and understand the word of God better. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being with me with, for another powerful point to ponder. Look, if you don't have a church home, we'd love to have you become a part of St. Stephen Baptist Church. Uh, contact us, email us, newstart at sclive.org. I promise you we will get right back with you. God bless you. Well, today's Wednesday. And uh, we've got Bible study tonight, and I hope you come out and join us for Bible study. Uh, contact us, or excuse me, link in to, to St. Stephen Church at sscilive.org. And, and uh, we've got a word we want to share with you tonight in Bible study, so come and join us. Uh, the pre-show begins at 6.30 with Miss Crystal Goodness Spratt, who's just remarkable. Then we'll have some worship, and then I'm going to give a very brief message. I'm going to make a point. It won't be long, but I hope it'll be strong, because you don't have to be long to be strong. So join us tonight uh, in Bible study. Peace and blessings to you. Don't forget the same bee that produces the steam produces the honey. Peace and blessings. Love you much. And don't forget our final salutation. It's COVID-19. We're still in COVID-19. So during COVID-19, don't forget to stay safe, stay sane, and yeah, wear your mask. I'll see you tomorrow.